While 1997 was looking to be a promising year for the doctor, he had no idea that one routine procedure he'd performed that day would drastically change the course of the rest of his life forever. Dr. Anthony Pignataro had a thriving medical practice. He had a wife and two kids that he loved very much and a good reputation in town. It really seemed like 1997 was going to be his year. 26-year-old mother of two, Sarah Smith, was scheduled to have a breast augmentation. As they led her down the steps to the basement for surgery, she didn't find the typical sterile operating room she'd expected. The basement was dark, dingy, and stuffy. A mess of tubes and surgical equipment lay scattered on the table. But still, the doctor assured her it was a simple procedure he'd done many times before, and Sarah figured she should have expected this for the bargain price she'd paid for it. Dr. Pignataro had no anesthesiologist or registered nurse present. His only assistants were his wife, Debbie, who had no medical training, and a young licensed practical nurse who had only been practicing for six months. During the surgery, Sarah woke up and started complaining of pain. So Dr. Pignataro ordered a little more sodium pentothal to numb the pain. As soon as they injected it, Sarah's system started shutting down and she was losing oxygen and yelled out that she wasn't breathing. And Anthony started poking at Sarah's chest and calling out her name. They called for paramedics, but by the time they arrived, Sarah was gone. The result was an open of too much anesthesia with no anesthesiologist to monitor her. An investigation into Dr. Anthony Pignataro revealed that he was not a board certified plastic surgeon. In fact, he wasn't a plastic surgeon at all. He trained to be an ear, nose, and throat doctor, but didn't even finish. So technically, he wasn't even a f***ing doctor. Medical experts told the investigators that Sarah would have survived if Dr. Pignataro had the proper resuscitation equipment at his office. They also argued that the specific augmentation that Dr. Pignataro was performing was an incredibly invasive one and should have been performed in a hospital or certified surgery area. Dr. Pignataro claimed accidents can happen in surgery and that on occasion people do react badly to anesthesia and could pass on the table. Nevertheless, prosecutors charged him with manslaughter. To avoid a trial, he pleaded guilty to criminally negligent homicide where he was fined $5,000 and sentenced to six months in prison, plus 250 hours of community service. Anthony also lost his medical license, which I guess he somehow had, but the Pignataro's problems were far from over. When Anthony got out of prison, he unsurprisingly had a bit of a rough time finding a new job. Anthony realized he was never getting his medical license back, which meant his dreams were over. This crushed him and had an effect on his marriage as well. After the Pignataros reconciled and moved back in together was when Debbie started to get sick. But Debbie's illness was stumping the doctors. The neurologist thought it was Guillain-Barre, the gastro doc thought it was pancreatitis, and her specialist suggested pre-leukemia, but none of them could piece it all together. Debbie was in the hospital for weeks at one point when things got so bad, and Anthony kept telling the doctors that they should have her gallbladder removed, but the doctors disagreed. But suddenly, just like that, she just got better. And they were like, huh, well that was weird, lol. Debbie's symptoms would continue to come and go, with each time the pain getting more severe with each flare-up. During the summer, Debbie's condition got worse, until she eventually had severe memory problems and could only use a wheelchair to get around. Once again, she went to the hospital, and this time they stuck a sample of her bone marrow under a microscope. Her doctor noticed something that he'd never seen before, and was immediately reminded of something he'd read in a textbook in medical school years ago. He noticed that somehow Debbie's red blood cells had degenerated. With that, he ran downstairs to the library and grabbed the book on toxicology. The degeneration of red blood cells meant that she was being poisoned. Somehow, Debbie had well over the lethal amount of arsenic in her system, 
legitimately one of the highest levels that had ever been recorded in a living person. She was immediately put under 24 hours security protection. But the question was, how was she being poisoned and who wanted her gone? Anthony told detectives that he suspected Sarah Smith's family might have had something to do with the poisoning and mentioned when his house was tagged with spray paint. Hasn't this poor family been through enough? Don't drag them into an investigation. To figure out how long Debbie had been unknowingly consuming the arsenic, they took a sample of her hair to analyze. Unbeknownst to ye old poisoner, arsenic binds with keratin proteins, aka the major protein in hair, and forms a committed relationship with it. Once together, our celebrity couple travels through the bloodstream and eventually reaches the hair follicles where the strand of hair will grow out with traces of arsenic in it. The computer revealed shocking results when her hair showed that the first time Debbie had ingested poison was in early May of 1999, where she would continue to receive small doses throughout the summer until the end of July 1999, when she was given a large dose that was approximately 80 times more than what any normal human being should have in their system. In March of 1999, when Debbie and Anthony had separated, Debbie's hair showed no poison in her system. When they reconciled in May, the signs of arsenic started showing up in Debbie's hair. The largest dose of arsenic was given to her in July of 1999, which was when she ended up in the hospital. That was the hospital visit where Anthony recommended removing his wife's gallbladder to the doctors, who told him she wouldn't survive it. When questioned by police, the couple's daughter remembered her dad setting up these traps around the house on the floor the summer her mother got sick. They asked her what they were for, and she said she didn't know, but she remembered they were just these little round tins. Only one manufacturer made insect repellent in small round tins, and a check with their company revealed that their product did contain arsenic. They said four of those little tins were enough to be lethal to a 150 pound man. Investigators found this brand of insecticide at a store not far from Debbie and Anthony's home. Debbie didn't want to believe it, but she knew the tests couldn't lie, and she was devastated. When they checked Anthony's background, however, they realized they might have found a possible motive. Now, investigators believed that this whole entire poisoning had been a ploy to get his medical license back, or how he thought he was going to get his medical license back, because it's a stupid plan. The plan was that Anthony would give Debbie poison. She developed gastrointestinal issues. Then he'd successfully convince the doctors to perform gallbladder removal surgery, which she wouldn't survive. Had Debbie accidentally peaced out on the table, Anthony could argue, as he did in Sarah Smith's case, that people occasionally pass away in surgery and that he shouldn't have been singled out and punished for it. But how did Debbie survive the massive last dose of arsenic that he'd given her? Experts say this was his own medical miscalculation. When Anthony gave his wife smaller doses of poison in May, she developed a tolerance to it. So the higher doses later had less of an effect on Debbie. Investigators believed he vandalized his own home and spray painted it to make it look like it had been retaliation for Sarah Smith's incident. When Anthony was shown the forensic evidence, he pleaded guilty to first degree assault and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Yeah, assault. He promised to tell where he obtained the arsenic and how he administered it, but he never honored that part of the plea agreement. Although Debbie survived insane amounts of arsenic that was 80 times higher than a lethal dose, she will continue to suffer debilitating side effects for the rest of her life. In December 2013, Dr. Anthony Pignataro was released from prison and made his way to Palm Beach, Florida. Three years later, he legally changed his name to Anthony Hote and began advertising himself on an elderly care provider website in 2019. The police were informed, but because he's technically not performing the duties of a licensed doctor, he can continue to work that job. So if any of you have grandparents in Florida, maybe give them a call. <laughs>